If you've never heard of Gamergo, then consider yourself lucky. They are widely believed to be one of the worst companies in the MMO landscape, and their recent behaviour has all but confirmed this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome! I'm Josh Drive Hayes, and I don't normally do drama, but I am an MMORPG channel, and this is a gaming company that affects anyone who enjoys MMORPGs, so settle in and grab a drink, because we have a lot to unpack. As usual, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters and Twitch subs who make videos like this possible and support the channel. More on this at the end. For now, Let's begin. Recently, you may have heard of the MMO games Defiance, Defiance 2050, Twin Saga, and Eden Eternal shutting down, and even more recently, the MMO Rift having its staffing cut back heavily. Well, all these games are owned by Gamergo, and the unfortunate situation of games dying or being cut back is actually the inevitable reality of what happens to all Gamergo games because of how they work. Here is why. Let's start with some context. Back in December of 2020, I received an email from a marketing agency, the kind to offer YouTubers pay promotion and sponsorships. The email was on behalf of the gaming conglomerate Gamergo. Apparently they liked my MMO videos and wanted me to promote their games. This included things like Fiesta Online, Arcage, and Aura Kingdom. I responded saying how it was great to be contacted and how of all the games, Arcage was likely the one suited to my audience, I'm still a small channel, and company emails still excite me. Then the agency laid out the rules of this video. It would need to be a certain length. At the start of my video uploaded to this channel, it would need to stick to a script, a set of several bullet points the company had approved, and nothing of my own personal flair would be added. This I was not happy with. Whenever a company forced reviewers or advertisers to stick to a script, it shows a lack of faith in their own product. So with that limitation, I decided to decline the affiliation offer and instead go a different way. I continued my worst MMO ever series focusing on Fiesta Online, a game ago produced game. The video did very well by my channel standards, combining pedantic nitpicking with genuine mechanical critique. This video likely killed any potential for me to work with Gamergo in the future, but now Gamergo have killed three games and crippled a fourth within a month. And that fourth game, Rift, I happen to actually quite like. So for those of you unfamiliar with Gamergo, let's examine who they are, how they work, and why you should start to worry whenever they pick up your favourite MMO. I'm looking at you, Wizard101. To begin to understand Gamergo's position within the industry, we need to look at three major areas. The general approach that other companies have to creating a long-term successful project, then the Gamergo way, and then the business culture within the company. Let's begin with general project management. This may seem simple to some, but it's vital foundation knowledge needed to understand the rest. Any profit-seeking project has two major numbers to consider, numbers more important than all others. The cost to create and develop the thing, and then the revenue generated by the thing. Let's call the cost to create and develop A. This includes all the money a company put into making something and making sure it continues to grow. From employee salaries to consultation fees, artists, managers, paying rent on the building your team works in, keeping the lights on, staff food, staff parties, executive bonuses, the game's marketing budget. Value A is every single penny that goes into making the project. In general, the correlation is the higher this value, the higher quality the project can become. It doesn't always work that way, but putting more money into something lets you hire better people and work with better equipment. And in games design, especially MMO design, that means better artists, better developers, and better hosting infrastructure. Now the second value, the project's generated revenue, we'll call this B. This is absolutely all the money created by the project. In case of games, this will be the sale of the base game or the expansions, monthly memberships, cash shop sales, and in some cases merchandise and even convention sales. Value B is basically how much you make. The difference in these values is the profit or loss of the project, normally measured over a year. If A is higher than B, you're spending more than you're making and you'll make a loss. If B is higher than A, you're making money and will generate a profit. This is basic economics so far, so now we can get specific. If a project is focused on long-term growth and consistently generating a considerable and growing profit each year, one of the best business decisions is to funnel a large amount of profit generated, that's the excess on column B, back into creation for the next year. That's column A. Simply put, if you make profit, investing that in your project, using the money you made to make your product even better, is a good idea. If you're focused on long-term growth and creating the highest quality project you can and you believe this is a sustainable thing to do, then you actually want these two bars to be relatively close to each other. The more you invest, the better the game becomes and so the more it generates. It's a positive feedback loop. 
However, you will notice I've used the phrases long term and high quality, and this is where the problem comes in because these are factors ignored by Gamergo, because they have a much more insidious business model. It works because it generates vast amounts of profit, but in the process, it destroys the game. Let me show you. Gamergo are part of the MGI Group, which are a global merger and acquisitions company. These companies generate massive profit by buying smaller businesses or projects and maximizing revenue from them over the short term. And it's this short term profit focus that causes the damage to the product in the long term. And here's why. When Gamergo buy an MMO like Rift or Fiesta or the recently acquired Wizard 101, they look at these two bars, money spent and money generated, and they have effectively two very simple goals over the long term reduce A as much as possible and increase B as much as possible because the money generated on B is not going back into A. It is going to the executives because they need to buy another yacht. To reduce A, you could get rid of staff to lower wages, reduce the frequency of updates so you don't need as many developers, reduce customer service reps so player bog or abuse reports take longer to close, or host the game on cheaper infrastructure so it crashes more. These are all realistic possibilities. Then you increase B, which is often done by looking at what you can sell within your game and maximizing it, such as a cash shop. Some people might say, if this was the plan, why not make every game a paid subscription? And that's because doing that doesn't always increase profit. Often the best choice for profit is to make the game free and vastly increase the cash shop while making it pay to win in the process. I've covered this much more fully in my evil way free games make money video. So now we have a game with very low input and very high output, extremely cheap to make and very profitable. How is this bad? Well, that's another important business trick. You see, when you lower A, the customer experience, that's the gameplay the average player will actually get to experience, doesn't change immediately. There's a delay. Sometimes it's a week, month, sometimes years. The reduced input doesn't impact the game overnight. It slowly filters through. Maybe bugs start being found and reported, but not sorted. Maybe the game stops being updated for a few months and then a few years. Or the advertising slows down. Maybe you start to see recycled content as the developers are forced to reuse old assets because there are no new ones being made. Then you'll notice the B increase. You'll see more items in the cash shop. You'll see loot boxes is being added. Maybe the monthly membership goes up a little or it becomes a optional VIP that's essentially necessary. Maybe you start getting more aggressive marketing emails offering you limited time items for the low, low price of whatever they think you'll pay. Slowly but surely the scale tips. Input down, meaning lower quality experience, and output high, meaning more aggressive monetization. Now for the company, the end of year reports look fantastic because for the first year or two, sometimes three, of this happening, the profit generated, that's the difference between A and B, is huge. You put the bare minimum in, but you got so much more back out. This is fantastic in the short term. But what happens when the players begin to realize this and the B value, that's the money generated, starts to drop? Simple. You place the game on life support mode with minimum staff so it's costing you as little as possible and then you move on and do this to another game. Gamergo are not concerned with the long-term health or growth of a game because that isn't their business model. They buy a game, vastly profit from it in the short term by exploiting the cash shop, then move on to another. This leads to a very specific workplace culture, which could probably accurately be described as a graveyard company, a place where once great games go to die. Not just a peaceful, dignified death, but a hideous, monetized death, desecrated shells of their former greatness. From the public acquisitions records we can find, we can see that Gamergo buy small companies, advertise the games they acquire in the short term, then ultimately let go of a high percentage of staff and expect the remaining ones to pick up nearly double the workload, while at the same time adding in a cash shop and pushing the items in it. Then they will either sell the now skinned company for a quick profit using the reduced cost increase revenue to overvalue what the company can actually realistically do, or keep them as a portfolio piece to show off how many games they own. When Tryon ran Defiance or Rift, they had a team of over a hundred people working on them you could find on LinkedIn. Now Gamergo own those games and through trawling forums and the LinkedIn pages we can see there are barely 10, plus a handful of the most basic IT support staff. 
As for Fiesta Online specifically, the reason it doesn't get developed or any major updates is because it doesn't bring in enough profit. It's actually a smart business decision for them to let it sit idly by. The reason that games are treated as purely business decisions or maths puzzles is likely due to how the upper GamerGo management don't actually believe in or focus on the long-term success of any of their games. They don't seem to know what makes games fun or good or sustainable, and even if they did, it wouldn't match their business model. They just see X increase in profits this year as a good thing, and they ignore all the effects on whatever game they're ravaging today or if those profits are sustainable. Because even if they aren't sustainable, you just move on to another game. They have no connection to the games, just the profits. Some of you might be screaming about how they'd make more money in the long term if they invested in their games, and while you might be right, consider the following risk. If you could risk making 500k a year on a game, and have that game become popular and sustainable and well-loved, but remember there's always a chance it might fail. Or you could guarantee that you'll definitely make 500k in the year, but in doing so you will absolutely destroy the game and make sure it never becomes popular again. Which would you choose? If you love your game and think it has a chance at long-term success, you will put your heart and soul into it. If you are a soulless corporation and simply want profit, you will happily kill the game every year knowing you can just buy more. There are probably a few of you listening who would happily kill the franchise every year because you want profits and that's your business choice. And that is exactly what happens here. Beyond that, if your boss cares about profits, do you really want to be the guy to suggest, hey, maybe we should make less money this year because maybe in 20 or 30 years time when we're not here anymore, someone else might make more if the game succeeds? No boss wants that or will take you seriously if you suggest that. So here's a really big question. Why MMOs? Of all the projects you could do this to, why choose gaming and why choose the MMO genre specifically? Well, it's because of the built-in captive and in some cases addicted audience. The sunk cost fallacy is one hell of a thing and they are fully exploiting it. For anyone unsure of what that is, let me explain. Say you have a car. It's a decent car, but it needs a repair and it'll cost you £100. Or you could buy a shiny new car for £1,000. You go and get the repair. Then a few weeks down the line, the car needs another repair. This time it'll cost you 200 but the shiny new car is still only 1000 Well, now the sunk cost fallacy kicks in. And you think, well, I've already spent a hundred on one repair. If I buy the new car now, that 100 is wasted. So you spend the 200 on another repair, a new expense now to justify an old one. This happens again and again and again until eventually you have spent more money repairing the old car than it would have cost you to just buy the new one. Why? Because every time you choose to spend another 100, you're not thinking about just that hundred. You're thinking about all the previous money you've put in so far and not wanting that to be wasted, you keep spending. This is the sunk cost fallacy. The psychological idea that you have spent time and money on something before and therefore you must keep doing so. MMORPG games have mastered abusing this fallacy. Combining it with a Skinner Box style feedback loop, these will all be individual videos because the psychology of game design is fascinating and you have created an environment perfectly designed to trap players, especially those with addictive personalities. You only need to look at the comments section of my videos to see no matter how bad a game is, how greedy the company or how toxic the experience, someone will defend it and someone will spend money on it. The MMO genre is the perfect genre to do this because hardcore players will accept so much before they finally break. And GamerGo know this. They specifically buy games with dedicated player bases because they know the return on investment is almost guaranteed due to the player's desire to not leave a game they love. Players will happily become blind to the awful changes GamerGo make to their childhood game in order to keep their own narrow-minded nostalgic version of their game alive in their minds. On top of this, instead of just shutting the games down, keeping them on life support means you always have the chance to capture a whale. In the gaming world, whales are players who spend a large amount of money on a single game. Three or four whales can easily outspend three or four thousand regular players. So GamerGo keep all their games doing just well enough that they might, if lucky, land a whale. GamerGo don't need to spend time, effort or money on upgrading or actually developing anything they have because that's a risk and that might not pay off for them and they don't like risk. But you know what always pays off? Buying something. 
reducing the operating costs, throwing in a cash shop, ramping up the microtransactions and milking the player base for all they're worth before they finally get sick of you and move on and the game dies, because then you just do it again. Keep all these games alive on the bare minimum just in case someone rich and nostalgic drops by, but don't in any way risk actually making something good. Honestly, I do feel sorry for the designers and developers, because in all truth, they probably do want to make the best games they can, but the financial executives, the ones with the power to assign resources and money, are often focused entirely on profit margins. Even if those executives do consider themselves gamers, they must put aside their personal preference and focus on profit. Which, as we've seen, is accomplished in Gamergo's case through reducing spending on a project, increasing monetization of the project, and then enjoying the large profit margins while they last. And then, when the game inevitably dies, as they all do, move on to another game. But is there any fix to this? Well, yes, actually, and it's a remarkably easy fix, and it involves doing this single thing that Gamergo will not do. Investing the profit back into their games and risking a success. Hiring developers and designers. Get some Q&A testing going on. Spend the money you make to make the games you have world class. If you are willing to take the risk, then you are worthy of getting the reward of a good game. I've been sat in management meetings for various companies I've worked for before, where several hour-long discussions have focused on how to improve the quality of something without spending any actual money, and the answer is always the same in every one of these meetings. You can't. If Gamergo want to improve the games they own, maybe bring some of those zombie games back or sort out the plethora of issues with the larger games they have, they need to invest in them. Let the game designers do what they do best. If you hired a graphic designer or a small development team whose only job was to improve Fiesta, it would be improved in no time. But doing that would cost money, and it's a risk because you might not get the money back if you do improve Fiesta and people continue to not play it. This is the unfortunate reality of the grave you have dug for yourself. You have the reputation of doing this to games, so now when people see you own a game, they assume it's going to happen and just move on. I have many more worst MMO ever videos to make and many more Gamergo games to play, and I will always be fair to them. I praised Defiance 2050 for its excellent gunplay and I enjoyed the core gameplay loop of Rift. But I won't shy away from pointing out mistakes, like Fiesta Online's missing collision detection, or Fiesta Online's music, or Fiesta Online search menu having a typo, or just the rest of Fiesta Online. It's extremely simple. If Gamergo want to be seen as more than a company that buy small games, monetize them, and then milk them dry, then simply stop doing that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. Another thank you to my Patreon supporters and Twitch subs who make my content possible. You can support the Patreon from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and Discord. And as always, have a great day.